from the line. Uh, line muted. July the 19th, 2021, as we uh, prepare to study and engage uh, in studying and reading God's word on tonight. Let me thank each of you who have already uh, logged into the system and those who are uh, logging in as we speak. Thank God for your faithfulness. And we pray that each of you are remaining safe and that you have had a wonderful, wonderful Monday uh, thus far. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started with our lesson on tonight. We're going to open up with a word of prayer. And I'm going to ask um, Sister Marion Henderson, if you are on the line, Sister Henderson, if you can um, open us with a word of prayer. Sister Marion, we would appreciate that so greatly, so much on tonight. Uh, Sister Henderson, are you there? Yes, sir, Pastor, I'm here. Okay, thank you so much for opening us with the word of prayer. Okay, thank you. Most gracious and heavenly Father, as we come this evening on a de another day that you have created, Lord, we thank you. We come this evening, Heavenly Father, giving you all the praise, glory, and honor. Dear Lord, we thank you for your darling son, Jesus, Heavenly Father. We thank you for everything he did while he was here on this earth for us, Heavenly Father. We thank you for extending to us your grace, mercy, and your love. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for all of us, not for the things that you have done, but the things you are going to do, as well as those things that you have done. And thank you, Heavenly Father, for the things that you are doing. We, I ask blessings for all of us. I ask for love and care for our pastor and his family, for all the work that he is doing in your name, Heavenly Father. I thank you for all of his friends who are pastors who come and assist him, uh, participate in our conferences online, who come to our church, whose church that he visit as well, Heavenly Father. I thank you for uh, your healing prayer even before I have an accident, Heavenly Father. Thank you. I want to extend blessings and ask blessings for our thick and shed in, for all of New Mount Zion church members, and all of those who are on the line, Heavenly Father, whether they are members of our church or not. Thank you, dear Lord. Again, thank you for this day, for allowing us to get up and see this beautiful day that you have created. I thank you for the rain, Heavenly Father. I also ask blessings for all of those people in other countries who are going through floods at this time, Heavenly Father. Ask blessings for all those who are in the hospital, Heavenly Father, and the nursing homes, and the VA uh, as well, Heavenly Father. I pray for those members, family members of our, for the sick members of our family members who are, are ill right now, Heavenly Father. Give them the health and strength to continue on, Heavenly Father. Touch them, Lord. Touch them as you have, have touched me, Heavenly Father. Give them the strength. Give their family members strength, Heavenly Father. In, these, in Jesus' name, I ask these blessings. Amen. Oh, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Henderson. Thank Bless you, you for that prayer. And we thank God again for each of you, all of you who are on the line uh, tonight as we seek to learn and study God's word on tonight. All right. Last week, we uh, covered a lot of ground as we studied uh, Genesis chapter 25 on last week. Um, we, we covered much of that chapter, uh, only a few verses. I wanted to give a, a little bit more uh, thought or, or talk about some tonight. but before. Uh, we cover uh, those last few verses that I want to cover or talk about in chapter 25, and we're going to move into ch chapter 26 as well. Uh, but before we do that, I want to hear from you all on tonight, if the Lord says the same, that way we can uh, glean and learn from each other. Uh, if someone can remind us of some of the things we covered last week, we would appreciate that uh, on tonight. Any three or four individuals. Reverend uh, Tobias, there was um, a couple of things that I, I thought about. One of them was um, Ms. from Reverend Broom had mentioned. I worked with a guy who was a Muslim. And Line unmuted. He talked about, uh, when we talked about Jesus Christ, 
and he always said that uh, Elijah Muhammad was his Jesus Christ, and that let me know how how like Muslims feel that they really didn't have believe that Jesus Christ was God's son, but they felt that Muhammad was basically the and had the um, same um, same thing. But uh, one of the things that I, I was main focus was about the religion that believed in one God. And, um, those three were Judaism, uh, Islam, and uh, Christianity. Those three things, that's the three types of religion that had only had believed in only one God. All right. Thank you, Deacon Dennis McCullough. You're absolutely correct. Uh, those are the three uh, basic religions that we call uh, monotheistic uh, uh, beliefs. They believe in one God versus uh, polity, polytheism, uh, believes in more than one God. And the major difference, as Deacon Dennis McCollum just stated, is uh, Christians and Muslims, uh, we do believe in uh, God, the creator of the world, uh, but where we differ is our thoughts or belief as to who Jesus Christ was or is. Thank you, Deacon Dennis McCollum. All right. Anyone else? What else did we cover uh, last week that any of you, some of you may want to share on tonight? Well, I had a problem with that uh, point that the Dennis the, just raised, because we were saying when Abraham died, he was gathered up to his people, and we said that mm -hmm. meant that he went to the Christians, and then uh, when Ishmael died, it says he was gathered to his people, and it seemed to me we were saying that meant the same thing as it meant with Abraham, and my question is, is there a... Uh, Muslim wing up there in heaven. <laughs> the Muslims go to because they don't believe in Christ. So how can they go to the same place as Abraham? And, and maybe we should not use that word. Thank you, Dr. Wright, for pointing that out. Maybe we shouldn't use that word Christian because, you know, the terminology Christian being Christ-like didn't unfold or manifest into the New Testament time during the era of Jesus Christ. So so here in the Old Testament, the belief was in uh, God being the supreme ruler of the world and having a direct relationship or walking with God. We should say it that way. Those who actually walk with God. So uh, when the scripture gives reference to Abraham being gathered uh, with his people, though, that gives reference to those individuals who actually had a relationship or walk with God, much like Enoch was, because you know, in the Old Testament, it talks about and Enoch uh, did not die. He was translated because he walked with God. He had a relationship with God, so he went directly to be with God. So uh, thank you for pointing that out, Dr. Wright. We, uh, 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 that terminology Christian may not be used in the Old Testament because that didn't come into play until Jesus Christ in the New Testament. So it mostly or mainly gives reference to those who actually had a relationship or those who walked with God. Okay. All right. You. All right. That that helps some, Dr. Wright. Yes, it did. Thank you. Yeah, right, right. That's why it's so very important to make sure our terminology and what we uh say as it relates to give giving reference to the old testament and new testament is vitally important because Christ does not or did not come on the scene until the New Testament. All right, anyone else? What else did we learn or glean last week? Because we talked about Ishmael and the fact that he had uh, 12 children and they became the leaders of uh, 12 tribes so that God uh, blessed him to some degree, uh, not as much as Isaac, but he was blessed with having these 12 uh, sons. Exactly. All right. We gave reference, we gave reference to uh, who Ishmael was and his sons and also talked about, uh, I think we gave reference to uh, that um, uh, uh, religion, Islam, uh, started or began uh, with that lineage. All right. One or two others. What else? Anyone else? Anybody else? Anyone else? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hello. It's Tina. Yes, ma'am. We hear you. Okay, Ishmael, you know, we also said that Isaac had as many sons as Ishmael, and he lived to be, a, uh, Ishmael lived to be 127 years old. Okay, uh, I think that was Sister Tina. 
Is that you? Yeah, it's my <laughs> All right, 137. I think it was 137. 37, that I'm sorry. 37. Right. 37. All right, thank I'm you. For, you're absolutely correct. 137 years old. All right, one other. One more. Anyone else? This yeah. be real sad, Miss Sutterway. Yes, ma'am, Miss Sutterway. Yes, we also went over that um uh uh, J- uh Jacob. I mean Rebecca and what we call married when he was they had been married at twenty, but he's had their children till he got sixty. Okay, I think I think I think you mean that they when they got married they were married twenty years. I believe that. Is that correct? They were married 20 years before they had children. Yes, he was 40 years old. He was 60 when he had the baby. When they had right, the baby. exactly. They were twins, brother. So bad, but I don't see how that could be. They were fraternal twins, but they fraternal twins don't be born in the same sex. So how can Jacob reach in there and pull Esau all that? <laughs> right. They were uh, uh, fraternal twins. They were not identical. Uh, and, and I believe the Word of God gives reference to uh, 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 Isaac and Rebecca being married for 20 years before they had or gave birth to uh, their son. All right. Anyone else? Anyone else? Before we jump into our lesson tonight, anyone else? Well, the two things I wanted to cover, we, uh, Sister uh, Leslie Jennings and I believe... Um, Someone else was giving reference as we studied those last few verses. I believe it was Sister Johnny Gregory. We were talking about in verses 23 as to how uh, favoritism now uh, rears its ugly head. And I wanted to just say a few words about that thought. Now, if if you think about it, and I don't want to spend too much time here, but if you think about it and look at it, uh, you will see or you will discover uh that 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 the parents here were being irresponsible and the truth of the matter is they were uh exemplifying what i call or consider to be carnal behavior so you have the parents here exemplifying carnal behavior because the word of god gives reference and it shows us that esau uh became sports minded uh, he was irresponsible, not caring for family or business affairs. He was much like a uh, sportsman. But then when you look at Jacob, uh, the word of God says that Line muted. The, the opposite of Esau. Think about how Jacob was. He was a mature, quiet, settled man who, who the word of God gives reference to one who looked after the affairs and responsibility of the family. Now, this is where the mistake comes in, or or the sin, in my opinion, comes in, because the parents here make a grievous mistake. And if we are honest and truthful about it tonight, this is a mistake that is made far too often by parents even today. What is that mistake? They show favoritism and partiality for the boys because the word of God clearly says that Isaac favored Esau whereas Rebecca favored Jacob. Think about this. So so Esau was favored by his father. Now we don't know exactly why that is the case. Uh maybe it's it, it I don't think it just has to do with uh with food. It probably means that maybe Isaac himself Long to be an outdoor person. We really don't know. But Rebecca favored Jacob. This was only natural. I believe this is natural for for Jacob was the son who was responsible and he was the son who looked after and worked for the welfare of the home. So you see here where favoritism rears its ugly head. Now, Sister Leslie uh so so wonderfully stated last week that this is something that parents must guard against uh which is showing favoritism and partiality among their children because this 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 passage of scripture shows us that even godly parents even godly parents can make this grievous mistake 
just like Isaac and Rebecca. And, and it will soon be seen when we look at uh, the rest of this uh, text or this chapter, it will be seen that favoritism can cause division within the family. We know so many, or I do, I should say I do, I don't know about you all. I know so many families who have been torn apart because the father showed favoritism to a child and the mother showed favoritism to another child. This does absolutely line unmuted division and causes conflict and tension in the family. Any thoughts or comments there before I continue? I want to say something else about that, but I want to hear from you all if there are any thoughts or comments uh, as it relates to favoritism. Any questions or thoughts or comments there? This is, this is Marion. Yes, ma'am. Uh, sometimes I think it's it, um, how one parent or the other decides how they're going to raise line muted and uh, we as parents have to realize that children can cause conflicts mm. in a home. Mm. So so we have to be careful of that as well. It, in a sense, it's favoritism because mm -hmm. one parent raised a child one way and the other parent want to raise them the other way. And um, they get into confusion where uh, one parent will listen to a child uh, who possibly could be lying just to get the attention of the parent he wants mm. and uh, cause conflict with the other parent. I know when, right. when I was coming up, my mother and father, if one told us to do something and we went to the other parent, they would say, what did your mom say or what did your dad say? Because they had already talked about, I guess, uh, now, if, if this happens and they come to me, I'm going to bring it back to you. And if they right. lie, they're going to get chastised. So, like I say, we have to be careful not only of, of the siblings in the home, uh, but other family members coming in and trying to cause confusion as well. Right. And it's, right. It's, I, I guess we have to, you know, like they say, if you're unequally yoked, then you're going to do that. But as parents, if you do something for one, you should do it for the other. Not because right. of one, one child may be lighter than the other. Some people, I've known some friends of mine. They had twins. One child was light in it and the other was dark. And the mother paid a t more attention to the light in the girl than she did the dark. And, and you know, that causes confusion with children, too. You know, it's a lot of, yep. lot of issues that come up. But like you say, this, this, this favoritism or, or, or lack of communication between parents is a, is a big issue. It, not yes. only today, but it has been so in the past. And you are absolutely correct. I, I like that, and I'm glad you stated that, because sometimes parents are guilty of this, and then the child uh, uh, picks up on various things, and they would use that to their advantage. So you'll see in this particular passage of Scripture, this is what happens. So, so initially, we see carnal behavior with the parent. And guess what? Because there's carnal behavior with the parent, when you get down to verse 29 through 34, you will see carnal behavior of the children. So this is a short story that shows us how far a person can go in giving himself over to the flesh and the pleasures of the world. Because when you get down to verse 29 through 34, I'm going to go through that real quickly. We'll see how Esau uh, responds to his carnal nature just to satisfy the pleasures of his flesh. Now, at the same time, we must understand that Esau uh, was physically hungry, whereas Jacob was spiritually hungry. So that is the difference in the two. Jacob was all about trying to 
uh, uh, be the head of the family, uh, be or operate as God would have the head or leader of the home to operate, whereas Esau was completely about trying to satisfy his flesh. Now, uh, one thing I want to say about that, and then we're going to move on to chapter uh, 26. One thing about Esau, you can tell that he was operating in the flesh because his willingness to give up his birthright shows just how irresponsible and spiritually insensitive he really was. Because the word of God says this, on the spur of the moment, he followed the pleasure of the moment. He was hooked on the world, material pursuit. So satisfying the pleasure of his flesh and flesh alone, his responsibility was uh, his responsibility for the affairs of others, not for the family, but it was all about trying to satisfy his hunger and his flesh. Whereas Jacob was the exact opposite. Jacob was committed both to the spiritual and physical welfare of the family, because if you read the text clearly, it says that Jacob was a plain man who stayed in the tent. So he literally uh, coveted the birthright to be the head of the family. Now, this is where the problem lies. God had already spoken. God had already said that Jacob was going to be the head of the family. The problem is Jacob tries to satisfy or rush his blessing and receive it outside of the way God intended for him to receive it. Because Esau committed himself physically, uh, the corner trying to satisfy the flesh, whereas uh, Jacob, if he, had, if he would have been patient, waited for God to do what he was going to do, Jacob would not have to, uh, quote unquote, uh, twist his brother's arm to receive the blessing and or the birthright. So you see carnal behavior with the husband and wife, the mother and father, but you also see carnal behavior with the sons as well. Any thoughts, any questions there before I jump over into chapter 26 on tonight? Questions, thoughts, or comments right there? I have a thought. All right. Who, who might that be? Uh, Sister Gregory. Yes, ma'am, Sister Gray. Um, I was wondering because, okay, we said that Esau was a plain man, but did he did he not trick Esau? I mean, Jacob was a plain man, but did he not trick Esau into giving up his birthright instead of reminding him or telling him what was you know what was going on or what he was giving up? He did. He, he did. Him. Without question, he did take advantage of his brother. He did. That's where uh, the sin of Jacob comes into play because he did not have to do that. God had already prophesied or mentioned earlier in that chapter as he uh, spoke to his mother while she was praying that, that the elder son would bow down or the younger son would rule over the older son. So he did uh, uh, take advantage of his brother without question. Any other thoughts or questions, comments? All right. Now, since, since that covers chapter 25, as we move on into chapter 26, we're going to see something take place that has actually uh, happened before. Now, what's interesting is uh, what Isaac is getting ready to experience in these opening verses. Now, I, I want to kind of mention uh, this before we jump into chapter 26. Um, it's amazing how history has a way of repeating itself. If you notice this, and if you read this chapter clearly, and if you took time to uh, digest it or understand it, you'll see where history is sort of repeating itself. Watch what happens in the life of Isaac, because as you read this particular chapter, the opening part of this chapter, you will see that Isaac is being tempted to do something. And we're going to discover what he's tempted to do. And then 
God tells Isaac to do a certain thing. And I, I raise the question if Isaac actually obeys God after God gives Isaac a certain command that he is set or supposed to do. Uh, Deacon Sylvester Ford, if you are there, if you can talk to us real quickly, Deacon Ford, uh, in, in reading or interpreting verses one through six, can you tell us or your own thoughts what Isaac is being tempted to do? And is Isaac actually obeying or going to obey? Line unmuted. Ford, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, good evening to everyone. Um, and, and when I read this chapter, um, and, and it first started talking about the family, and this was the second go round of the family. You know, a family is a uh, land that is not able to produce the goods that will uh, help mankind. So Isaac was tempted uh, to leave because of the family. So what Isaac did, he went to Abimelech, who was the king of, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And uh, and the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down to Egypt. Because he had a thought of leaving Ra to go to Egypt to get out of this bad land. So he was told, sojourn in this land. And sojourn means temporarily stay here. Now, how long sojourn is, I don't really know. But I know it's a temporary uh, place for you for him to stay. And God told him, if you sojourn in this land, I will be with thee and will bless thee. For unto thee and to thy, I will give all these countries. And I will perform the, which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And mm. Abraham was in the land of a famine also. And he okay. told him, that, I will make your seed multiply and will give unto thy seed all these countries and in thy seed to all the nations of the earth be blessed. Mm. And because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my law. I okay. did not see the he dwelt in Jerah. Okay. All right. Great, great stuff there. Thank you, uh, Deacon Ford. That so so you you hear you hear where uh Deacon Ford mentioned that this uh happened in the life of Abraham as well. I'm gonna give reference to that scripture in a moment. But but what goes on here as Deacon Ford just stated, Isaac has been tempted or he's being tempted to forsake the promised land. He's actually residing in the promised land at the time this famine uh, comes up. So a famine arose in the land, and, and notice the word of God gives reference. In verse number one, there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that happened in the days of Abraham. What did Abraham do? Abraham left the promised land and went down where? To Egypt. Guess what Isaac does? The, he's getting ready or he's tempted to do the exact same thing. So, so Isaac is being tempted to forsake the promised land because of this famine uh, that arises. So Isaac was fearful that he was going to face the loss of his ranch, his farming business, his herd, his flocks, his crops. So he literally stood on the brink of losing his wealth, losing Abraham. And, and remember how wealthy he was because everything that he had, he had inherited most of it from his father. So, so think about what Isaac is afraid of. He's afraid of losing it all. So guess what happened? So obviously this famine was so severe that Isaac feared bankruptcy. And in his mind, he's saying, what in the world am I going to do? Am I going to stay in the promised land? 
or forsake it, go south, let me go down to Egypt, where there was rich fertile land, plain a market for his herds and crops. He was being tempted to leave the promised land. Watch this. Leave the promised land. He didn't want to lose all his wealth and his riches. So he decides to go to Egypt so that he would, quote unquote, be in a safer or better environment to protect his riches. So what happens is, you see, Isaac becomes weak under pressure. He, he, he turned away from the promised land, much like his father, moving his herd, his flock southward toward Egypt. And then the word of God says, guess what? On the way to Egypt, he stopped in a place called Gerar. Now, this was the capital of the Philistines to ask help of Abimelech, who is the ruler of the Philistines. You'll see it in verse number two and verse number one. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. Guess what God does? God appears to him in verse 2 and says, wait a minute, look. The Lord appeared to him and said, go not down to Egypt. Stop where you are. Don't go to Egypt. Dwell in the land which I, shall, I, I, I will share or show thee. Sojourn in this land and I will be with thee. I will bless thee for unto thee. And unto thy seed, I will give all the countries, etc. The same promises he makes Abraham. Then look what the word of God says in verse number six. And Isaac dwelt in Gerar. So the truth of the matter is, Isaac did not fully obey God because he did not go back to the promised land. He stayed in a place called Gerar which literally was the border or, or in between uh, Egypt and the promised land. He was so fearful or afraid to go back to the promised land that he settled or stayed in the rock. Now, what we can glean or learn from this is a believer or a Christian should never forsake the promised land of heaven, never turn to what may appear to be better market, offered by the world. So a believer must never compromise his hope to gain the possessions and riches of the world. That is the problem that Isaac is experiencing here in the opening part of chapter 26. He's tempted to go to Egypt and he does not fully obey God and does not go back to the promised land. And you will see what will happen or what will happen or unfold in these verses because he did not go back to the promised land. Any questions or thoughts or comments right there before I go on any further? Any questions, thoughts, or comments? So so you see here, he 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 is not exemplifying full faith or trust in God because he does not go back to the promised land because of the famine that is going on in the land. He wants to go to Egypt or stay close to Egypt because he's afraid if he goes back to the promised land, his cattle may not have food to eat, his oxen, all of his possessions may go down the drain, and he wants to stick close to Egypt because he thinks he's able to maintain his wealth closer to Egypt. He's putting his faith or his trust in the environment and not put in his faith or trust in God. And it's amazing Amen. because this is the exact same thing his daddy did. Wow. What's that? What's that? Questions, thoughts, or comments? Uh, Pastor, I just want to say, do you think that's what's, what's that, that, that's a lot of what's going on today? We think we, we want to, as they say, uh, think that the grass is greener on the other side yes, and, ma'am. And, and, Without question. And, 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 and try to try to get more than we have uh, and, and end up losing what we do have. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That is absolutely so true. And, and here's the problem. Two, two things I see here. One is what Sister Henderson just stated. Uh, we don't have our faith or trust in God like we should. 
But number two, the second thing that just sticks out in my mind is, as parents, we must be absolutely careful, prayerful about what we do. Because what will happen is the same mistakes we make, Lord have mercy, Jesus, our children can possibly end up making or doing the exact same thing. You see it very clearly. This is what Abraham did. So Isaac does the exact same thing. Wow. So so that's what happened in the opening part uh, of verses uh, 1 through verse 6. Isaac is being tempted to, to flee the promised land, go to Egypt, and he does not obey God fully because he parts or stayed in Gerar when God told him to go back to the promised land. So, 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 so that actually, uh, Sister Charlotte, I didn't mean to answer your question, but uh, we're going to get your thoughts on it as well. It shows us how Isaac is acting like his father, but notice what happens as well. When you look at this particular verse of scripture, Abimelech noticed something. Now, number one, Isaac acts like his father. Well, let me hear from Sister Charlotte first, and then I'm going to give my my thought uh, on, on another way or area that he's acting like his father. Uh, Sister Charlotte Cannon, if you are there, can you talk to us real quickly about uh, how Isaac is acting like his father and also what yes, did sir. Abimelech notice while he was observing their behavior? Yes, sir. I certainly can. Good evening, all. Uh, in my reading and uh, referring back to my notes, um, uh, also, which I really like what you had stated in one of our uh, uh, assignments, he committed uh, what you call a major failure. Isaac followed his father's example. Both of those men had beautiful wives. In two separate instances, uh, Abraham feared that Sarah's beauty would lead someone to kill him to get for her, so he asked her to lie and say she was his sister. Reference Genesis 12, 10 through 20, and 21 through 18. Uh, Isaac, in his case, and that he was like his father, um, he committed the same, uh, he repeated the same act by stating that Rebecca was his sister. Now, in his case, it seemed like a long time to pass a little bit, and maybe they got just a little bit slack on the, on the uh, charade, but the couple, you know, I guess, I guess to pretend that they were siblings or could have been that the Abimelech had an unusually good vantage point for observing them. But in any case, he saw Isaac and Rebecca, Rebecca acting in a way which convinced him um, that they were married. And uh, in verse 8, and it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out at Brenda and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebecca, his wife. And what I did, I went and looked it up to find out uh, about the word sport. And in the Hebrew term, sporting is based on the word sokak, which means laughing or caressing. So this would have given the Abimelech, uh, 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 their actions gave him um a uh, 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 reason to believe that uh, they were involved in some type of intimate activity, which would not be normal for siblings. Mm. So he did, he did follow in his father's footsteps. As I, I looked at my notes and went back and saw um, where I, I had been down to that he was like his father. And, and to a certain extent, he put himself first and he did exemplify uh, selfishness. Uh, that was mm. part of his actions also. Wow. Wow. Great, great stuff there. <laughs> this, this is amazing because two, you, you see at least two ways he's acting or resembling his father. One is he, he, he's fearful and he leaves the promised land, headed to Egypt, number one. Number two, he lies about who his wife is. Wow. He lies about who his wife is. Where in the world he get that from? His daddy did the exact same thing. Now, Sister, Sister Cannon has really made it clear and plain because what helps me a lot when I read the Bible, it always helps 
if you have other information to help you interpret it. One thing that helps is is what I call uh, some Hebrew or Greek uh, 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 concordance that helps you to understand the terminology that is being used. She explained to us that when the Word of God says 40, if you look that up and do research, it actually means, as Sister Charlotte just stated, to be flirtatious, caressing, maybe patting her on the leg, on the shoulder, in a sexual way. So watch what the Word of God says in verse 7. So the men of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, she is my sister. For he feared to say, she is my wife, lest said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebecca, Rebecca, watch this, because she was a fairly attractive woman. She was fair to look upon. Came to pass when he had been there for a long time. Now, notice this. This, this, this really helps and shows us how, uh, uh, I want to see the words I want to use, how when an individual becomes too comfortable in their sin, there lies the possibility of exposure. Good God Almighty. When individuals become so comfortable in their sin, there lies the possibility of exposure. The Lord just gave me that. That's what happens in this text because the word of God says, watch, watch what verse number eight says. And it came to pass when it had been there a long time. That says to us that, that Isaac and Rebecca have been holding this secret or telling this lie for a while. Guess what happened? They become comfortable in their sin to the point or the place they start flirting with each other in public. Lord have mercy. Look what the word of God says. And it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of the window and saw and behold, Isaac was sporting or flirting with Rebekah, his wife. Abimelech called Isaac and said, wait a minute, behold, of a surety, she is your wife. And why did you say she is my sister? Isaac said unto him, because I said, lest I die for her. He was Hmm. afraid or fearful that they would take his life if they knew that Rebecca was his wife. Wow. So the sin of lying by claiming that Rebecca was his sister was the other downfall of Isaac. And then you would discover that he's behaving much like his father. Hmm. Wow. Questions, thoughts, or comments right there? Questions, thoughts, or comments? Wow. Yeah, that was what like, yes, sir. Go ahead. I think, yes, that's exactly what Abraham did when he was faced with that problem. The exact same thing. That is not a coincidence. That is not a coincidence. So so the point that we can glean or gain from this is Isaac was obeying God, but only half-heartedly and partially. He was still afraid to trust God completely. He was still afraid to trust God fully, still afraid to trust that God would take care of him in the face of his trial. He still felt that he had to hang on to the world to lie and the help and security and gain the security from the world. Lord have mercy. Now, here's the question we must ask ourselves. This is a personal question. How like so many of us, good God of mine, how like so many of us that we only have partly follow the Lord when trials confront us? Wow. When trials confront us, we keep one foot in the church, the other foot in the street, trying to follow God while keeping the other foot in the world as well, (laughs) depending Uh on the world. Wow. 
question comes to come in. This is exactly what Isaac is doing. And watch this. Because he's where he's not supposed to be, you will find himself getting involved in more sinful action. Had he remained in the promised land, he would not have had to lie about who Rebecca was. Wow. What's the and, I, I, and again, I think that shows us that we forget that God is in control and he knows mm. and sees them all. And we mm. think that what we are doing is okay. But if another person is doing it, we try to uh, talk about them or lie on them or whatever. But the sin is the sin. So we still wow. have to remember that God is in control and he sees all and that what what's done in the dark sooner or later is going to come to the light. Mm. Wow. Thank you, Sister Henderson. Any other thoughts, comments right there? Questions, thoughts, comments right there. All right. So once Abimelech realizes or recognizes that Rebecca is his wife, this is what is interesting to me. Abimelech charged all the people. Look at verse number 11. Well, go back to verse 10. It says, Abimelech said, what is this thou hast done unto us? One of the people might lightly have lined or leaned with thy wife, taken thy wife to uh, be with them. And thou shouldest have brought guilt upon us because of the lie that you have told. Verse 11 says, Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He that touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Guess what happens now? When you get to verse 12, you, you'll discover in verse number 12, um, uh, Abimelech uh, has, has some form of reaction when he noticed how God is blessing Isaac. Uh, Deacon Dennis, uh, if, if you yes. can read those verses and talk to us real quickly about, uh, we see the response or reaction of Abimelech when he finds out the truth, but then that he also has an unusual response or approach when he noticed uh, the prosperity of Isaac. What, what, what's, what's your thoughts there, Deacon Dennis? Okay. Um, it starts in verse 12. It said, then Isaac, uh, I, then Isaac sold in the land and received in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. And, and the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. For he had possession of flocks and possession of her herbs and great store of service. And the Philistine envied him for his for all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham, his father. The Philistine had stopped them and filled them with earth. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. One of the, thing, the key thing there, I noticed that, that let, that famine in the land really really played a real, real big part in that about the famine, and Isaac had you had stated before Isaac had already had his father's possession, and he did not want to lose it, so he ended up staying dwelling in the land, and God continued to bless Isaac because of his father's covenant that he had with him, and and because he had continued to gain all the oxen and all the different things, his neighbors started to get jealous because at that time that famine was still in the land and everybody else was suffering and this and he is still doing well. So the Abimelech noticed all of his possession and everything was going on and he felt afraid of God because he saw how God was blessing Isaac even though there was a famine in the land and everybody else, and even his neighbor starts to fill up his well, his well, because water during that time was a great commodity. And they were so jealous of him, they filled his wells in. And so uh, Abimelech got upset and he was angry. So 
he had told everyone not to touch him, so he ended up asking Isaac to leave. And Isaac moved um, to like to to Garak where he continued to uh, to live there. Mm. All right. Thank you, Deacon Dennis McCollum, so much. Now, the, the, the two things that stick out in my mind as Deacon Dennis is probably going to uh, cover some of what Deacon McCollum just stated. Number one is this: this, this is what's exciting and, and just so uh, why you ought to love God. Isaac is being blessed even in the midst of his wrongdoing. Good God of mine. Isaac is being blessed even in the midst, who could not love a God like that? Isaac is being blessed of his wrongdoing. That's number one. But watch this. As Deacon Dennis just stated, he's being blessed in the midst of a famine. Think about that. A famine is going on. And God is causing him to prosper in the midst of his wrongdoing. But God is also causing him to prosper in the midst of a family. Now, now we can think about that and relate that and tie that to COVID-19. If, if, if some people be honest and truthful, we have been, been, we are, and some of us have been blessed more during this pandemic than we were prior to the pandemic. That's amazing because God has a way of blessing and sustaining his people, number one, even when they do wrong, and he has a way of blessing and sustaining them when things in the world don't look right. Amen. And that's what he's doing to Isaac. He's blessing him in the midst of his wrongdoing, but he's blessing him even in the midst of a famine. Now, what's amazing is, <laughs> good God, the Lord just told me something else. Abimelech knows and sees the wrongdoing of Isaac. And I don't care what nobody say. The truth of the matter is, when people know you've done wrong, when the people have seen you do wrong, some people can't stand to see you blessed by God. When people now it's it's a difference if they don't see it and they don't know it. But when you know a person is doing wrong or have done wrong, when you know they've told a lie and made a mistake, <laughs> it, it it does something to that person when they see God's hand upon you and bless you anyway. That's what we see here in the text tonight. Abimelech knows Abraham has lied, heard the lie, and he becomes envious and jealous because of his prosperity. Wow. Because God blessed Isaac so much. God blessed Isaac in order for many reasons. One, in order to secure him and his offspring uh, in the promised land. Remember, Isaac had told a lie. But the Bible says this. The Bible says this in verse number 12. Then Isaac sold in the land and received the same year of a famine a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. His personal wealth became great. In verse number 13, the man waxed great, went forward, and grew until he became great, for he had possession of flocks, possessions of her servants, Philistines envied him. They had become jealous of him because they cannot understand, number one, how he's being blessed in the midst of a famine and how he's being blessed even when he's done wrong. Good God of God. This is where a child of God ought to get happy and shout because God will bless you even when you're doing wrong, but then he'll bless you even in the midst of a famine. Yeah, and his neighbor even built the uh, whales up to stop the war. Right, right, <laughs> exactly. Wow. Matter of fact, the word of God is so clear. It says that Isaac's wealth increased so much that the Philistines began to envy him, and their envy soon turned to spite. This is what they're going to get. They get ready to do. They set out to hurt Isaac by crippling his operation. 
raiding parties were sent out to strike at his water supply, his well. Matter of fact, the word of God says they were so mad to the point they began to fill his wells with dirt. Look at verse 15. For all the wells which his father's servant had digged in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines had stopped them up and filled them with dirt. Wow. Because they, they thought, they thought, of course, that this would threaten his ranching and farming operation. And it also caused a, a rift or some tension in their relationship, the relationship between Isaac and the Philistines. So, so eventually, this is what happens. The king uh, saw Isaac as a threat to his kingdom. And Abimelech asked Isaac in verse number 16, he asked Isaac to literally leave the area. Look at what verse 16 says. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go, get away from us, for thou art much mightier than we are. He could not stand to see Isaac being blessed. And the truth of the matter is, Lord have mercy. There are so many people who can't stand to see some people being blessed, especially when they know what they used to do, how they used to live, some of the lies they used to tell, he became envious and jealous and asked Isaac to leave the area. Mm -hmm. God. Question thoughts are coming. Question thoughts are coming. Uh, this is Dr. Sonia. I have a comment. I was going to save it till my question, but let me go ahead and make it now. This is what we call favor, Pastor. You know, oh my God. I, Isaac is reaping the benefits of God's covenant faithfulness to his father because God mm. has Abraham. Line muted. Blessings that will be for all nations. In order to mm. do that, he has blessed that lineage. So, this favor is raining down on Isaac because of the blessings promised to his father. My God. Amen. Because if you go back to verse number three and four, it reminds us of the covenant, as Dr. Sonny just stated, reminds us of the covenant God had with Abraham. This is the favor of God being unleashed on the life of Isaac. Good God Almighty. And that should be all of our prayers. Lord, allow your favor to fall on my life. Amen. That, that's what I pray for every day. Favor, well, favor, pray. favor. Because God's favor. Amen, Lord. Amen. God's favor is more precious than life itself. Because yes. when you have the favor of God on your life, Regardless of some of the situations, I'm preaching to somebody tonight. Regardless mm -hmm. of some of the situations mm -hmm. you find yourself in, God's favor will still rain upon you. Yes, Amen. 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 Any questions? So favor me. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Any other thoughts are coming? And because of His favor. Because of his favor, Isaac uh, prospers even in the midst of this family, even in the midst of being where he should not be, doing what he should not do, God still favors him. Yes, Lord. Wow. And this, this, this says so much to us. It says so much to us. Even when Abimelech and his servants tried to hinder Isaac from prospering, guess what? They couldn't do it. They could not do it because he cannot stop the favor of God on your life. He can't. Right. No man can ever stop or hinder God's favor on your life. Amen. That's so true. Amen. All right. Mm -hmm. We have hit the eight o'clock hour on tonight, and we just made it down to verse number uh, uh, 
Where did we seven. stop? Verse number 17. 17. All right, yeah. 16 and 17. We've made it down to verse 16 and 17. So we're going to pick up uh, right around verse 16 and 17 again on uh, next week. And uh, we have some more uh, questions that will be entertained or answered next week. So uh, Brother Malcolm and Dr. Sonya and uh, uh, Deacon Ralph Willard, we will uh, get to you all next week if the good Lord says the same. Uh, thank you all so much again for these 65 plus lines, uh, uh, phone lines that have tapped into the system on tonight. We pray that the good Lord blesses each of you real, real good. So to Shirley Mance, anything you want to share uh, as it relates to our event this coming Saturday, we are looking forward. Thank God for his favor and for blessing us to uh, be a blessing to the community this Saturday. So, Sherla, man, are you there? You want to uh, make that announcement again tonight? Yes, I am. Um, just that we know our backpack giveaway will be Saturday, this time, 11 o'clock a.m. until 2 o'clock p.m. We want you to bring the children out. They need to be present. Um, you know, come and pick up their backpack, a few school items. Uh, Whataburger has given us a good treat. And I would like to mention the committee members, uh, LaShonda Price, Kimberly Austin, Brittany Bingham, Christopher Chapman, Malcolm Dodd, Hattie Jennings, Dennis McCullum, James Fiver, Reverend Tobias, uh, Valencia Williams, Janine Wilson, Ricardo Wilson, um, and thank them for their willingness to participate and to help us to serve God's people. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Sister. Amen. Sarah. Amen. Uh, God has blessed us. We will be giving out close to 700 backpacks this coming Saturday for uh, our youth, our young people in the community, our members, students, uh, children of New Mount Zion shirts, right at 500 um, uh, uh, uniform shirts for boys and girls, cases of water. And listen, when I tell you God favors you, uh, when Whataburger called me this past week, uh, she said, Rep. by well, what do y'all want? What do y'all need? And you know me, I don't ask for much. I say, well, whatever you all want to do. He said, well, can we just give 250 hamburgers? I said, bless the Lord. Yes, ma'am, whatever you all like to do. So we're going to be say. giving out backpacks, water, shirts, and free burgers to the uh, youth and those individuals who come out in the community. So let us pray that the good Lord will hold back the rain this coming Saturday. And I just believe that what you do, it is so much better to give than to receive because God is faithful. What you give out, he will give back to you, much like he did Isaac a hundredfold. Pastor, Amen. Just, will you please allow me to do a quick health alert before we close? And it may not be in financial or material blessings. He may give it back to you in forgiveness of sin and or good health. But I'm like you. In the way he blessed me, I'll be satisfied. All right. Thank Amen. you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Sonia. Pastor, Dr. Sonia. Yeah. Yes, I want yes. to do a health alert if you don't mind. I want no, to admonish, I, I want to encourage everyone. I know most of us, if not all of us on the line, are vaccinated. If you are not, please get vaccinated and please take your young people 12 and older to be vaccinated. The, we are on a fourth wave of COVID. It's really being driven by the Delta variant. Over 90 percent of people who are getting ill are unvaccinated. However, the numbers are really increasing for the vaccinated people getting the virus as well. Now, they do not suffer significantly as do the unvaccinated, but nonetheless, uh -uh, vaccinated people are getting COVID as well. So let me encourage you, even though you are vaccinated, unless you have to go in large gatherings, um, and if you do wear your mask, continue to practice social distancing and using your hand sanitizers. And people who are vaccinated, if they are exposed to 
someone that has contracted the disease, they do not have to quarantine. However, we would like for people to err on the side of caution. So if you know you are exposed to someone who has COVID-19, if you would make the choice, even though vaccinated, not to um, you know, go around everybody else. So I just wanna encourage and, and everyone to please be mindful of the situation that we're in right now. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Dr. Sonny, for uh, continuing to get that word out. It is very much, very much me. Amen. I think I heard someone else. This is Todd. Was someone else getting ready to make an announcement or say something? Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sonia, for reminding us of that. All right. Uh, pray uh, that God will continue to bless, keep us, and uh, uh, keep all of us safe and in his care. Uh, Thursday at 12, we look to have our midday prayer uh, this coming Thursday at 12. So please, ma'am, please, sir, if practical, uh, if you will call in and participate on that prayer uh, line this coming Thursday. Uh, today, tomorrow, today started the uh, 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 convention, Mississippi Baptist Convention uh, general session. Uh, 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 commence today. It will be going until Wednesday, I believe, and the election for state president will be tomorrow. So we want to ask that each of you be in prayer for our state convention, uh, that God's will be done. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, Sister Juanita Taylor, if you are on the line, Sister Juanita Taylor, can you close us in a word of prayer? Sister Juanita yes, Taylor, are you? All right. Thank you, Sister Taylor. And we look to see you tomorrow as you cast your vote. Thank you. May we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we have heard tonight. We ask you to bless us as we prepare to go to bed and have a peaceful night of sleep. Bless each one that's tuned in. Bless each family that's represented by the ones that are tuned in. Help us to become more open-minded and eager to study your word. Bless our pastor. Bless our convention. And bless the affair that will be Saturday. Let it be a blessing to those that need it. These and many other blessings we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Again, Amen. thank you all so much uh, for participating on tonight and until uh, Thursday at 12. May the Lord bless and keep each of you in his care. Have a wonderful, wonderful night. Be blessed. Amen. 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 All participants.